Antignish Soho says that when one serves the master, he should not serve the master for the sake of reward, but rather you should serve the master not for the sake of reward. Could you imagine somebody gives you an opportunity, one of a kind, and it's the ultimate privilege to be associated with that person. And then after you offer your service to that person, which you feel privileged that you were able to accommodate his needs, he offers you a payment. You feel almost like embarrassed. I mean, here I feel I'm the recipient and the beneficiary of the greatest honor to serve you. I'm embarrassed that you should give me offer me. It's like it 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 speaks terrible about me that that indicates the reason why I accommodated you was for the sake of this the payment. A person who recognizes who God is, and anybody who is a beneficiary to the smallest degree of what God provides for us. What level of love should you have for God? There's a mitzvah of, of Avas Hashem. There's a positive you must love God. We once spoke, mentioned, if a stranger goes out of his way and provides you things which are unheard of in the positive sense, you will love that person. Because he say, why is he doing it for me? Why is he singling me out and providing for me things which are unheard of but in the positive sense, in the positive vein? It must be because he values me. When you feel valued by another individual and the person treats you out of the ordinary well, automatically you will be attracted and you will love that person. It's naturally. Because that person is special to you because of the way he's treating you. So love is natural. It's a fact. So we once spoke, a stranger who does one ten thousandth of what a parent does, if he treats you unusually kind and special, you will love him. And yet, your own parent that does endlessly more than the stranger, you will not have that same intensity of love towards your parent. Why? So we explained, because when the parent does for a child, he's not doing for the child for the child. He's doing for the child because the child is the child of the parent. When the stranger does for that person, he's doing for the person, not because this person who's doing the benefactor has no relevance to the, be to the beneficiary. So when you do for the person and you feel valued, that touches you in a way that it causes you to love your benefactor. That's the difference between a parent and a stranger providing even a fraction of what a parent provides. In reality, you ask any believing Jew, that that you live, that you have health, that you have success, everything in your life, is it due to God's willing that you should? You'd say yes. And yet, we don't feel the love for God. As much as there's a mitzvah to love God, but do you feel really emotionally attached that I'm dedicated to God and I love him because of what he does for me? You don't feel it. Why don't you feel it? Because the answer is because God does for everyone. God is a creator. He provides many things. And not only that, many things that I have because the person has to take certain initiatives that it's only because he also contributes to his being the, the, the beneficiary. So that somehow takes the edge off it, that you don't see it that clearly. So God is similar to a parent. He's not singling me out for me. I don't feel that. He provides all humanity. So since you don't feel special, you don't. Have, it doesn't touch you. It generates that love towards him. Even though factually, you will admit your health, your intelligence, your success, your safety is all only because God wants you to be where, where you are. 
You don't deny it. But yet, you don't feel love. So if that's the case, even though you don't feel it, you should not serve the master for the sake of reward. Because in reality, based on what you've received, you should love him. And if you love him, you need a reward. A person who does for his parent because he loves his parent or he loves his wife or he loves his child, does he want to be compensated to do for his child? If he truly loves his child, parent is naturally motivated to do for his child. You don't expect anything in return for what you provide for your child because you love your child. So if that's the case, when you serve God and you should serve God with love and with reverence, because we recognize and understand who he is. It's a privilege to serve him. Not only because of what he does for me, but because of who, what he is. So by serving him for the sake of reward, what is that? It's literally, it's an insult. It's saying, God, you're not who you are. Who you, who you really are meant to be. Because you are the provider. And you are that infinite being. One of a kind in existence. The one who wills existence. What do I want to be rewarded? How could I, could I not feel privileged that I'm able to serve the creator himself? So if you do it for the sake of reward, it's, it reflects, speaks very bad about you. It's an insult. Could you imagine the king calls you up and he says, could you please bring me a bottle of wine? He says, oh, excuse me, uh, you know, a bottle of wine that costs so much, could you give me the, the credit card to pay for it or the means to pay for it? You're asking the king to pay for it. The king wills your existence. You're his subject. Everything about you, you exist because of his beneficence. And you're asking that he should pay for what? For your service? And he should reward you for your service. It's the ultimate level of disrespect. It's open denial of what, what, the, what he does for you. So he's telling us, when you serve the master, it should not be for the sake of reward. It should be not for the sake of reward. Openly, I'm not, I don't want to be rewarded. But God will reward you. It's like a child does for a parent because he loves the parent. And because the child shows the love to the parent, the parent even wants to do more for the child. So what was the incentive for the child to do for the parent? The love. Now when the parent reciprocates, he reciprocates to a greater degree because he understands the love that the child has for the parent, identically with God. You should not do it for the sake of reward. And if you do it not for the sake of reward, you become even a greater beneficiary because it speaks about what nature of your relationship is. So even more worthy, more deserving to have that relationship with God. Torah, as we say, the billions of people in this world, endless nations. He chose us of all the nations to give us his Torah. The objective of creation is the fulfillment of the Torah. And he chose us, this little small people that comprise of 15 million people versus billions in the world to be his subjects, to fulfill his Torah. You don't feel privileged. You were chosen to be his secretary of state, Lahavdil. You're privileged. He chose us. That's the blessing we say before we study the Torah. What he gave us, he gave to nobody else. He chose us to give it to us. We should be the beneficiaries. Then you can say, by the way, uh, what's in it for me? Don't you understand if he chose you? That itself is the ultimate privilege that you were acknowledged by the creator to be that special people to receive his Torah, which is most precious to him. And I say it over endless. Person has a purebred dog. Speaking of course, Malachi's on. 
And this dog won every award in the world, every dog show. It's a breed, obedient, and a person gives it to you as a gift. And it's special. The whole world speaks about this dog. But you realize when you receive that dog, you got to have to get up in the morning and walk it. You got to feed it. You got to take it to the vet. There's a cost factor. But because it's known in the world that dog is one of a kind of a dog, you feel privileged that you were chosen to receive that dog. What about the responsibility to take care of it? If you understand what that dog is, and when you walk down the street, as the dog struts, you strut right behind it. So, God gives you what he says is there's nothing more precious than in existence. And he chose us to give us his Torah, which is considered his most precious commodity in the world. You shouldn't feel privileged. And you have to say, but you know, there's a responsibility. So what? When you get that dog, there's also responsibility. You got to walk it, you got to clean it, you got to care for it. You got to even take out health insurance for it based on the vet, the vet's fees. And you got to buy him a plot in the, in the dog cemetery with the tombstone. That's where we're, the world is holding. But it's okay. Because you value that dog. Because dog, the dog is man's best friend. You drive to Poughkeepsie to buy that dog. Where else will you drive? Okay? We drive to Poughkeepsie to do a mitzvah. Lahavdil. But to buy the dog, you buy you, you go to Poughkeepsie to buy the dog. I'm being very facetious, but very sarcastic. Happiness is a state of mind. Person can have everything in the world. If you don't have that state of mind to appreciate what you have and where you're at, regardless of what you have, you won't be happy. It's a state of mind. You have to process it, internalize it in a certain context to be able to be, to touch you, to be happy. You know, once heard somebody said to my Rosh Hashim, is turning the Farofa. You know, a person who's at a bris and he's a sandik, it, it's a school of, I mean, it, it's a good omen to become wealthy. The sandikos, to hold the child at time of the bris, it generates wealth. Wealth. So there's a famous question which is asked, have you ever seen uh, people who became the sandik at a bris, yet have they ever become wealthy? They're not written up in Forbes 500. All the greatest Torah sages, they, they were multiple times in one day, they held the baby, the newborn child, at the bris. Where's the wealth? There's no wealth. So they, they, they discuss it. So somebody once made the comment to my Rosh Hashiva, you've been a sandik multiple times throughout your life. You've never become wealthy. So he says, no. The mission tells us, Perkeovos, Ezer washa Samech Bechoko. Who is the wealthy person? The one who's satisfied with his lot. He says, every time I'm a sandik, I have a deeper appreciation for what I have. So as a result of every time I'm a sandik, I become wealthier. Because wealth is not dependent on material assets. It's if you're samech b'chelko. Are you satisfied with your lot? So if it becomes deeper and broader continuously, and happiness is a state of mind, because you can have it all and you have nothing. And you have very little. But if you're satisfied, you have everything. So if that's the case, is every time I'm the sandik, God gives me the ability to appreciate what I have to a greater degree. But therefore, I become wealthier. And it's a reality. It's the truth. Now, people, when they're younger, they envy many things. As you get older and you realize what, what life is all about, you realize that's not what it's about. And it's not worth envying, having any envy, and you wouldn't change, change places with these people for all the money in the world. Because you recognize and understand what, what it's all about. But you realize you have to have, have to be privileged to be able to see things that way. You know, some people, they never grow up. Their lens never changes. 
they always want more and more, more honor, more material, more everything. Other people say, you know something? I've come to a point in my life, I understand. I want my life to be less complicated. I want to do what I'm supposed to be doing. No distraction. We read in Pirkei Ovas, Mar ben Nechos and Mar ben Dago. The more you have, the more worry you have. The less you have, if you have enough, as they used to say, lean and mean, that's it. The key in life is to be focused. Be focused on what, where you're supposed to be, not to be distracted. That's what it's all about. If I understand where I'm supposed to be and what I'm supposed to be, I want to succeed in what I'm supposed to be. And if I have all this clutter, I'm not going to be able to achieve that. And if you can't succeed and be who you're supposed to be, you, you're the luckiest guy in the world. You should be the happiest person in the world if you appreciate that. And I always told this story. I'm not very good at telling of Hasidic stories because I wasn't, uh, you know, weaned on Hasidic stories. But there's one Hasidic story I relate to very well. There was a famous story. There was a, a Rebbe, a great Hasidic rabbi, and one of his Hasidim was very wealthy and he lost everything. And when he lost all his wealth, he felt his life has come to an end. Here he used to be, give charity and he used to help people and now he's no longer able to do it and he has turned people away and he's emotionally, he's, he's an emotional wreck. He feels his life really, God threw him a, a curveball, he's going, his life is going south. So he goes to the Rebbe and he says to the Rebbe, how do I regain my happiness? He says, I'll tell you the truth, I have a chosid, one of my Hasidim, his name is Rebbe Reb Zusha. Zusha, he's, he's a Hasid. He's, he, he's a weak travel from this town. You go to him, he'll treat you how to, teach you how to be happy, although he has nothing. Okay? The Rebbe says so. So he travels to this town, to this village. Comes to town. After a week's travel, and he starts asking around, uh, Zusha, where is he? He eventually was known as the Rebbe Reb Zusha, the great Rebbe, Hasidic Rabbi Zusha. He says, well, he lives in the outskirts of the town. There's a house. It looks like a hovel. Most of the windows have rags in them. The roof is, is caving in. The door is only on one hinge. You'll find them there. He travels to the house. He knocks on the door. He just touches the door and nearly falls off the hinge. Comes in. And... The person knocks on the door, person opens the door. He looks emaciated. Looks malnourished. The clothing is wearing a threadbare. He looks, he invites him in. And he says to him, why did you come? He says, your holy rabbi sent me. When he mentioned the name of the holy rabbi, he started a beam. Zusha started a beam. A smile, a level of happiness he's never seen. He's coming as an emissary of his holy rabbi. Come, walks in. He says, why don't you come in? Have a glass of tea. He looks at the, 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 the environment in the house. Earth and floor. The table looks like a few boards knocked together. The chair is rickety. He's never seen anything this, like this in his life. Comes out, he sits down, drinks the tea. He says, why, why did the holy rabbi send you? So he starts telling him of his travails and his problems and how he's depressed and he has nothing. And the rabbi, holy rabbi said that I'll come to you and you're going to teach me to be happy although you have nothing. As soon as he hears that, he gets out there. He, has, he starts grimacing. He says, I have nothing. He says, God forbid, I should say the rabbi thing made a mistake. I have everything in the world. What do you mean I have nothing? You understand? The man barely has a, a rag to cover his body. And he has everything. What's going on? This man need, must miss the boat. Does he have his hand, head in the sand? He doesn't wear the Brioni suit. He doesn't drink the, the aged wine that he pays who knows what for. His name's not in, 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 the, in, in the Wall Street Journal every day. As a rainmaker. None of this. But he says, I have everything. What's life all about? If you understand why you exist, 
and you meet all the criteria and have what you need to meet your challenges and fulfill your purpose to merit the ultimate, you have everything. How can you not be happy? I feel most privileged. The Jews in the concentration camp, they didn't know when their lives were going to be, be ended by the Nazis. They were malnourished. They were starved. They were tortured. But yet, when they could get a hold of a sitter and they would say, Fortunate is our portion. Fortunate is our lot. They'd be ecstatic. So one asked them, how could we be ecstatic? We're literally at the depths of hell here. Deprived at a level which is inhuman. And we say, The answer is, if you meet the challenge despite that, you know something? You've won the lot, you've won the biggest success of your life. You met the greatest challenge. Although they put you in a vice, and despite that, you don't question God and you have love for God. If this is happening, that's what God wants. It's in my best interest. And that's the way they internalized it. Therefore, it's Ashenema Tokel Kenemano Fortunate is our port, lot fortunate is our portion. That's what it's about. There's no such thing as envy. I should be envious. Do you think I'm env me? Not that I'm a tzaddik, that I don't have a yacht that the helicopter lands on the deck of the yacht. Do you think I'm envious of these guys? And they sit there with 25 girlfriends on the deck and they have all kinds of photographers sending these pictures all over the world to understand what it means success. Do you think I would want to change places for all the money in the world with these people? Not for a second. But other people say, what are you talking Are you out of your mind? You know what it means to have that kind of bank account to wear that watch? It's an antique that Louis XIV wore that watch, even though they didn't have watches in those days. They had sundials. But he wore that watch. It's a knockoff in Hong Kong. You realize, and you don't wear that watch. Envious of what? These guys go to Canyon Ranch and they, they eat alfalfa, alfalfa three times a day. You mean you're not you're not envious of that? You don't go to Canyon Ranch. You don't come back with that T-shirt that costs you twenty five thousand dollars for three days. But some people, they wait for that moment to tell the world what they could do, what nobody else could do. They thrive on this. But you know what it's all about? These people are off the deep end. They may say, you're off the deep end. It's around what you say. The whole world says the Jews themselves, we've been tortured and persecuted and discriminated because of who we are. But we ourselves know, we still say, Asher bochabani kol he chose us. He didn't choose the world. But they're able to kill us. They're able to crush us. They're able to persecute us, to discriminate us. It doesn't change the reality of who we are. In God's eyes, we are that special people. That's it. We are the chosen people. We are the priestly people. We're the kingly people. That's what we are. That doesn't change our reality. But you have to believe it. And believe it is not... Just a figment of one's imagination. It's a reality of what you feel. You internalize your, your, your dignity. It's a state of distinction of who you are. It's a badge of honor. Now let's talk. We're approaching Tisha B'Av. The first and second Beis HaMikdash temple was destroyed. Why was it destroyed? And we mourn, we grieve over it. We, we behave like mourners for 24, 25 hours on these two days. Every day in the Amido, we speak about the rebuilding of Yushalayim. We speak about the coming of Mashiach. There's something like we ask for healing and blessing. We ask for the rebuilding of the base of the base of Migdosh. Rebuilding Jerusalem, rebuilding the coming of Mashiach. We're the same way. Like you ask for the morsel of bread. And the material success, we're asking for that. Why are we asking for that? Thank God, you know, you go to Jerusalem. Let's see, we wouldn't have the Intifada. Things are great. Seems pretty good, pretty okay. 
I did the tunnel tour. I'm a VIP. Stay in the King David. Wherever you stay. What are you praying for? Give me a share. What, what's going to be better when Mashiach comes? Messiah. Messiah, the son of David. The anointed one. What, what's it all about? You know what it's all about? You know, a person, it's known fact the United States, and Malachi can attest to this fact, the two best zoos in the United States are the San Diego Zoo and the St. Louis Zoo. They have, zoo. they have zoologists there. There's no zoologist in the United States like the zoologists take care of the animals in San Diego Zoo and the St. Louis Zoo. Person says, you know something? I have an internist. The guy's already getting old. Somebody made me an offer moving to the zoo that provide me with the best medical care. Best vets, best zoologists, most advanced inoculations. You don't have to worry about. Every day, fresh meat, environment, climate control. You don't have to worry about global warming. It's all perfect over there. You even have a, a, a man-made lake, which is like the habitat in Africa, where we originally maybe you come from. Why not? You know what the answer is? Because you're not an animal. The zoologist is for animals. You're a human being. And if you think that is an exchange for that, then you know something. Then you're a face. What's life all about? What's life meant to be? What is purpose? Purpose is not, purpose is to succeed. Now the question is what success? Success is that if you use material as a means to an end, that's success. But if material is material for material, it's an end unto itself, then you miss the boat. You miss the point. That's not what life's all about. And that's that's the question. Why do I want? I'll tell you a story. Paul Reichman, a blessed memory, was the wealthiest Orthodox Jew in the world. Through years, he would give $131 million to, to, to Stoker, not charity, Stoker. And he was he was a Tamil Chochem. And he's a man who revered Torah and Torah scholars one at a one kind of a level. He was, at the end of his life, he had cancer. He wasn't well. And there was a certain person, Rosh Hashiva, who traveled to Toronto to see him because he was going to help him financially with his yeshiva. And he wasn't well. So he was in, in pajamas and a robe and slippers. And he told his attendant who was taking care of him to tell the rabbi, he'll see him in 45 minutes. He should wait in the in his home. He'll be out in 45 minutes. And 45 minutes later, he comes out. He's dressed in his suit with a vest. He's wearing his Hamburg. And you can see how not well he is. And he apologizes that he made the rabbi wait. Paul Rachman is about 15 years older than this person. And he says to him, I apologize. Why did it take me 45 minutes? Because I was in a robe and pajamas and slippers, and I felt it wasn't appropriate for me to meet you, a Rosh Hashiva, wearing a pajamas and a robe and slippers. So I had to change into respectful garb to greet you as I should greet you, being a Rosh Hashiva. Hear this. You're coming to him to receive a very significant financial donation. He's 15 years your, your elder. He's a man who's a Talmud Chacham. He's a man who's not well. So the person's come to say, understands why he's in pajamas and rope. He said, no, it's not appropriate. It's not showing proper honor, reverence for a person who represents what you are. You know what this is? This is a man who's the wealthiest Orthodox Jew in the world. What about the ego? What about this? You flaunt your wealth. You know what this, this is called? That's a tzaddik. Hashem says, I glorify myself with these kinds of people. These are my children, one of a kind. Who ever heard of such a thing? This is a role model. This should inspire us. So we, we celebrate, I'm using the word celebrate Tisha We observe Tisha B'Av. God is in pain that he had to destroy the temple. And why did he destroy it? 
Tisha B'Av is cl classified as a holiday. Why is it a holiday? Because God says, really, you, you people deserve to be destroyed. Except I destroyed the temple. That was the collateral I took that I shouldn't have to destroy you. So therefore, we celebrate that we weren't destroyed. He took the temple instead of us. But truth, what was the meeting place that we would meet him? We would have his children visit and sit at his table and interact and express his love for us. It was the temple. God is pained that he, he doesn't have that anymore. Why? Because we're not worthy. So we're grieving for God's pain, what we don't have and what he doesn't have. That's what Tisha B'Av is all about. And we sit on the floor like a mourner during the Shiva period. And you have to reflect on this. You have to think about it. Knowing it is not enough. Reflection is the key. To be distracted, it's not going to resonate. But that's what, that's what Tisha B'Av is all about. And we have nine days. It starts from Rosh Chodesh Av, And gradually, as we get closer, the mourning period intensifies to come upon the reality to be able to internalize what it's about. We read Echo, Elegy, which was written by Yirmiya, Jeremiah the prophet, who witnessed the destruction of the temple. He witnessed the Jews going to exile, going to Babylon. Here, the, the royalty of the world are being in chains, taking in chains to, to, to Bovil. The Babylon to be sold like slaves, like chattels, tortured, killed, murdered. But that's what it was. God's people and God's watching all this.